Hello, I am Michelle LeClaire, Executive Director of Buffalo Gallery. Today, I am chatting with Donovan Entrigan about his recent work, Caution May Contain Nudity, on view through September 17th. This exhibition includes oil paintings, encaustics, and charcoal drawings featuring the nude figure and may also be viewed on our website at buckhamgallery.org. Donovan makes paintings, drawings, and prints, and occasionally sculptures. Sometimes he works from observation, but mostly from fear and shares that memory, panic, and color wheels are pretty good tools. His work is intended to be, above all, visually effective. If you want words, he suggests reading a book or listening to podcasts. Before we join the conversation, I would like to say thank you to our incredible audience, whether visiting the gallery in person or viewing these videos online, and to all the artists who submit to our exhibition calls. I appreciate you. Next, I would like to say a big thank you to all the individuals and organizations who support Black and Fine Arts Project and Gallery, including the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, Michigan Arts Culture Council, the National Endowment for the Arts, Greater Flint Arts Council Genesee Grant Program, made possible by the Genesee County Arts Education and Cultural Enrichment Fund, your tax dollars at work. Thank you also to all of our fabulous community um, members. We certainly appreciate your support. Thank you. Welcome Gallery is pleased to present the work of Flint-based artist Donovan Entrican in his solo exhibition, Caution May Contain Nudity. Um, Donovan lives and works in Flint, Michigan, and is an artist collaborator at Buckham Arts Collective. He has an MFA from the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, and since 2015 has served as director of the art school at the Flint Institute of Arts. His studio is very messy with lots of spiders. Um, Donovan has won awards, including the J. Henry Scheidt Memorial Travel Scholarship in 2003. He has been in lots of shows, has been rejected from lots of shows, <laughs> haven't we all? <laughs> and is represented in public and private collections. And he wants everyone to know he calls his mom at least once a week. <laughs> Welcome, uh, Donovan. I am especially pleased to have this opportunity to chat with you. Uh, for everyone who doesn't know, uh, Donovan is a part of Buckham Arts Collective as one of our artist collaborators, and it is always wonderful to learn more about one of our artists. Um, so welcome. Thank you. Very, very nice to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how I like to start these conversations uh, is to learn a little bit more about your background, where you're from, and maybe what led you to the, the to art making? Sure. Uh, I started, I was, I mean, I'm from Flint, although I haven't lived here uh, necessarily for a big chunk of my adult life. Um, but I grew up in Flint and like every artist will tell you, I drew and did all that kind of stuff when I was a kid. Um, you know, I think that's, that's pretty constant for the most part. Um, but, you know, it was never a thing that even occurred to me that that would be, you know, a big part of my life. It was just a thing I did to impress girls and show off. And it was just the kind, of, it was what I did okay, right? I couldn't throw balls or anything like that. So I drew pictures. Um, but when I, you know, I, I started going to community college and, and, you know, trying to figure out what in the hell I was going to do with my life. Um, I took just for the fun of it, an art class at the community college. And that was nice. And I took another one and another one. And eventually I met uh, a Flint artist named Tom Newsom. And I didn't work with Tom very long, but he became one of those uh, artists that was, was pretty influential on me, especially in the idea that, uh, you know, I, I saw in him that this was the, the kind of thing that you could actually make a life out of. You could make a living, you could live this lifestyle, you could really dedicate yourself to making images and doing the thing that was uh, in, in some ways just kind of natural to you. It was something that you could pursue and make more than just natural. Uh, so that was a pretty formative experience for me. I didn't work with him very long. You know, I was young and ready to go do something else. Uh, so I went off to the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts 
uh, in Philadelphia and worked there for uh, a number of years, ultimately getting a degree. Um, but that training at the Pennsylvania Academy was very academic. It was based in, in traditional work, uh, a lot of work with the, the nude figure, mm -hmm. uh, working from life, all of that kind of stuff, very, very historical. So that got kind of baked into me uh, pretty thoroughly. And I've always worked with with the human figure. That was always the most important thing to me anyway. But then with that academic training and the, the constant working from life, that just became kind of a lifelong motif for my work. Uh, so that's kind of my path. You know, since then I, I make things and I exhibit them and I teach and I do jobs and live a life. Um, but art making is important things. <laughs> <laughs> art making is still a pretty big part of that. Yeah, well, um, let me bring up the installation view because you mentioned something that leads right into one of my questions. You mentioned that you've always worked with the human figure, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is largely based on your academic training over at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Um, and, and here we have this incredible exhibition, Caution May Contain Nudity. So it's not just the human figure, um, is it? <laughs> no, no. Um, so um, I always, you know, and, and maybe it seems a little more direct now, <laughs> but I always like to ask artists, um, you know, about their title and how it relates to the body of work. <laughs> sure. Um, so how did you come up with this title? Well, in many ways, and, and sort of the, the gist of my work is, is always a certain directness in uh, the subject matter and the motifs and things that I use. You know, I, I'm not interested particularly in being a clever artist. Um, you know, I, I don't want to make these kind of puzzles and things. What's most important to me is the aesthetic experience that an artwork has. Um, you know, so when I'm working with with the title and when I was putting together the show and and uh, everything like that, you know, it, it was just a very direct thing. It was, okay, this is a show full of nudity. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's not classical, polite, chaste nudity. You know, it's not that, you know, model on the model stand with with lights and the drapery and and this, you know, kind of uh, coy, pose you know that you see for hundreds of years in art you see that that pose or that series of poses and this isn't that and sometimes when uh people go to visit an exhibition and it's a figure painting exhibition they are expecting um you know more of that kind of traditional uh very very uh acceptable nude and of course i am very intentionally not doing that uh, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll put the caution up myself. So <laughs> before you come in, uh, you know, I think in, uh, it probably should have said caution may contain nakedness, uh, might have been a little more, uh, oh, I, love it. <laughs> I think in terms of just semantics, I think that would have made a little bit more sense, but, um, no, it was just being very, very direct. Listen, this is a, a show full of the nude figure and, uh, you should know that before you walk in. And that's, that was the title. Yeah, <laughs> it was perfect. Um, you know, I was rereading your artist statement before we, we met today. And I was thinking about how much I love it, not just for the brevity, um, you know, you don't have to read through a, a three page document to understand the work, but um, I, I loved, the part where um, the work is intended to be above all else, visually effective, um, and not necessarily having to read um, a document to understand or or to have a place card. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more. You also, of course, talked about you know the works you know being related to like. Um, <laughs> or, or sometimes inspired from 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 fear or shares of memory and panic and color wheels and, and whatnot. <laughs> sure. But um, the the visually effective, I think, is what really um, stands out. 
Sure. Well, you know, the visually effective uh, part of the statement really, I think, is the statement. Um, you know, an, an artist statement isn't an artist statement without a nice, healthy dose of bullshit. You know, so the, the fear and the color <laughs> wheels and all that, it's meant to be playful and fun and to kind of, you know, and, and that's that's fine, you know. Um, but the visually effective thing, I think, was the the kind of the crux of what I'm trying to do. And and again, you know, I kind of mentioned a minute ago that I don't really have ambitions to be a really clever artist. You know, I'm not the kind of artist that's going to, you know, sort of conceive of this, this idea or this intent uh, very specifically, and then, you know, try to build a practice or, or images or, or anything around that. I, I tend to work more like an abstract artist, uh, whereas I have uh, a motif and I just sort of run through that and see what kind of, of images I can draw from that, what kind of variations, what kind of moods and tones and things that I get. Uh, so again, in my world, in, in my practice, the very most important thing to me is that it is an aesthetic experience. And an aesthetic experience is one in which the, the elements of art, the, the experience of viewing an object or a work of art is the full content of that work. You know, it should affect you visually. For me, if it doesn't do that first and foremost, it fails as a piece of visual art. You know, if, if the first thing you see is a prompt to go read something, for me, that is not a satisfying visual experience. It can be an incredible intellectual experience. It can be an opportunity to learn new things, to, to go in different directions. But for me, if I can't look, have an experience, and move on without nouns and verbs getting in the way, you know, that's not a visual experience for me. So that 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 effectiveness, that ability to affect is the absolute number one criteria for me in determining whether or not a, a, a piece of art is working. Yeah, I love it. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> yeah. So something um, that is very interesting about your work. I mean, often artists talk about you know, one piece leads to the next. It's the act of working that that is the inspiration for new work, the creation that, that keeps going. It's, it's the, the act of working, which is definitely evident. Um, but it was really interesting, especially having this collection, this body of work here, you see certain um, compositions or poses that are, are done in multiples, but not just like multiples like of one painting. It, it's in, in a charcoal drawing. It's now in here, it's an acoustic. And I have a couple more slides with the paintings too. And I was kind of interested to hear about this practice a little bit, um, you know, which comes first um, in, in your process. Sure, sure. Well, uh, you know, again, I work, uh, very, very intuitively. I, I will make a mark. I will react to that mark. I will, you know, move things around and see what happens. And and for me, you know, the subject matter isn't really that important. You know, the subject matter helps set a mood. It helps to guide the viewer's reaction, you know, that that I may be looking for, or at least kind of open up doors for reactions that can happen. Um, you know, and certainly I, I think using the figure uh, as opposed to being a purely non-objective artist or, or anything like that, um, you know, obviously the figure has meaning for me. If it was just shapes and colors and things, I would just work abstractly, you know, so I don't want to make it sound like, you know, the figure is, is completely irrelevant. It certainly is relevant, but it's also at the same time not necessarily a subject matter. It's a visual motif that I use in order to get uh, certain effects that I'm, I'm looking for uh, in the work itself, but also in the viewer's relationship to the work. So that being said, you know, if I do, uh, for instance, this slide that you have up, it, it's the same composition, it's the same pose, definitely. 
but they are two extremely different pieces. So, so if I was to look, different, of course. Yeah, yeah. So if I was to look at this as a subject matter, like this is a painting about this figure sitting in this chair with this fern or whatever on the side, it would make no sense to do it twice. I've already had that idea. It's done, mm -hmm. right? But as a motif, as a vehicle for different kinds of uh, expression, then, you know, I can do the same pose, the same kind of composition over and over and over again, trying to find different angles or different effects or different feelings or color combinations. You know, so for me, I could do an entire show of the same model in the same room with the same prop and find, you know, just 20, 30 different ways of doing it. So it doesn't really matter. That said, um, also, in my working process, uh, you know, the traditional way of working is an artist has an idea, they do a sketch, maybe a detailed drawing before going into what is considered a finished piece, which would be a painting or a sculpture or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of the traditional way of doing it. I don't uh, do that at all. Um, you know, I, I sketch and I draw and I paint but they don't necessarily come in any order. And each one is treated as a finished thing. You know, mm -hmm. so a drawing and a sketchbook, uh, I will treat with as much care and respect as a, you know, seven foot tall oil painting. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, they are the same thing. Uh, and, and one isn't necessarily a preparation for another. I will make a, a painting, uh, and look at that painting and, and be satisfied with it and then wonder what it would look like as a drawing. You know, so I might go completely backwards or I'll sit in front of a painting or a drawing and do copies of it in my sketchbook and see what other kinds of new things can come from it. Um, so I don't follow that kind of linear uh, working method that a lot of artists uh, traditionally follow, uh, you know, and I'm certainly not the only one. Uh, but I do kind of think of my work more as um, a, a, a constantly sort of moving thing as opposed to projects where, okay, I'm going to do a painting and I'm going to start at the beginning and, and kind of move through that traditional process. Uh, it's all kind of going at the same time. Yeah. Well, let me, Did that answer uh, the question? I felt like I... <laughs> you did. Because <laughs> here's another one, right? Yep. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's it's fun and it's fun. Um, you know, I've been in, in this space for a while and I've been seeing them. But when someone new comes in and they walk around and kind of looking and then they finally start going, they'll have to go and circle back around. It's like, oh, wait, <laughs> um, it was kind of interesting because you talked about having being able to you could if you wanted, do a whole show of, of a single model and pose and, and, and in, in a space, just multiples of that. But it, it is my understanding, you don't, you actually you typically work from direct observation for these, right? I mean. No, no, and, and I guess in, in when I refer to a model, I refer to the image. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and one, one image will model for another image. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked for years, as you know, from models. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I very, very experienced with, with working from life, observing the model, studying anatomy, I, you know, and, and how light falls on objects, and how space works, and, and, and all of that. So at this point, uh, in, in this stage of, of my, my art making, I, I don't use a model. I don't use much of anything. Um, it's all from imagination or memory, uh, you know, and I, I start usually with a compositional idea, you know, so I want to, for instance, what you're looking at there, I was thinking about kind of dividing that, that picture plane into uh, sort of quadrants, you know, so I had kind of a off kilter vertical and then kind of an off kilter, uh, horizontal there kind of cutting across the bottom and that dictated the the position of the figure itself mm -hmm. and then I built uh you know as the main motif in the composition this figure that kind of followed that abstract dividing of the 
the picture plane. And so that's really how they evolve. And of course, that also helps to not necessarily explain, but but contributes to the the rather unconventional poses that they are in. You know, so when I'm working on divisions and and sort of these big shapes interacting like this, uh, it tends to have an opening up, right? You know, so it's not all compact and demure and and all of that. And then the reason, the primary reason for that is abstraction. You know, I'm very, very interested in how the shapes break up the picture plane um, and, and how that all works. Uh, you know, so it's not necessarily trying to be lewd with, with open legs and, and things like that, although the provocation inherent in that is a, a, a very effective tool in sort of working with, with any potential viewers. You know, so I know it does uh, have an emotional uh, effect on people that see it, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, being uh, upset or offended or whether it's being attracted or whether it's being embarrassed or desire or repulsion or all those things that it's hard to get with just abstraction. Mm -hmm. It's also hard to get with an established polite, academic nude. You know, you cannot trigger those kinds of emotions and uh, sort of visceral investment from a viewer uh, with polite stuff. You know, it's just not going to work. So if I want to really kind of grab a viewer and make them have to deal with something, this is a great way to do it. You know, so I kind of segued into another another thing there. Um, well, you did. And let me pull up the other slide because that's my probably my last slide I wanted to ask about here. Sure. Okay. So we do have um, visitors to the gallery who come in and, and, they, and it runs the gamut. You know, we have um, those who come in and they go, oh, is it pornography <laughs> if it's in painting? You know, can you even show this? And then we have others who, you know, maybe the the, their barber appointment is running late and so they kind of wander in to like inquire about that and decide they're interested and they want to come see these paintings they have to come mm -hmm. back when they have more time so can you uh, maybe talk about maybe censorship and and a little bit um or how people would might take the work you know uh, with a more you know fem is it offensive to to women sure well you know uh, i can speak only from my intention, certainly. Mm -hmm. I can speak from my understanding of images and art history. Um, however, you know, if somebody is offended by the image and and feels uh, strongly that it that it's offensive or it's exploitive or or anything like that, uh, you know, I certainly don't feel that I could talk them out of that or or even would want to. You know, um, it's it's certainly not my intention to offend. It is not my intention to create images uh, that are exploitive or degrading by any means whatsoever. And, and I do believe, you know, that I have constructed these images in a way that, that they are not. You know, I, I, I think, you know, as, as objectively as we can get, you know, I, I think they're, they're at their core, they are works of art that are meant to send you into yourself to make you kind of think about what you're thinking and feeling when you look at the um, image. Um, you know, however, there is, uh, you know, there's always that subjective layer. Somebody is going to look at it and it's going to bring to mind all kinds of things that are not appropriate to be, to be viewed in public, to be, you know, and that's, that's okay. That's the risk I run and, uh, in making images like this. I accept that. Uh, I wish people wouldn't feel that way about it, obviously. Um, but at the same time, having that reaction to one of my works is better than walking by it and not noticing it. You know, yeah. if I were painting nice little <laughs> apples on a table, it would be very easy to walk by and say, oh, it's a nice little painting or whatever. Or, oh my God, that guy can't paint for shit. Um, you know, that, you know that, that's the kind of reaction uh, I don't want. You know, I want somebody to say, oh, my God, what is he doing? 
<laughs> and then to walk away and think about it for three more hours. Think, my God, that exhibit was not okay. You know, if that happens three hours after somebody sees it, it's visually effective. Something yeah. happened. Now, it might not be the, the reaction that I personally intended or that I want, you know, and if somebody had that reaction and was willing to tour the exhibition with me and talk about the images and I could listen to what they're feeling and thinking and they could listen to what I was intending, I would love to do that. You know, but of course that that doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, that's not really censorship, but it is, you know, kind of this idea that I am choosing to make images that 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 can do that and I accept the risk. Uh, you know, and, and in terms of censorship, you know, we we in the United States love censorship, you know, for all of our free country flag waving stuff. Um, boy, do we love to censor. And, uh, you know, that's that's just the way it is. You know, I've had pieces censored. I've had warning labels. I've had protests. I've had, uh, you know, emails and social media posts calling me all sorts of uh all sorts of things. And um, thankfully, you know, that is, you know, less than 1% of, of all the conversations and all the uh, reactions that I've had to my work, you know, so I think that's, that's pretty acceptable. Um, you know, but uh, I have not had a work pulled from an exhibit uh, for, for its content. Um, you know, so in that sense, I have not been censored yet. Um, there have been there have been warning labels, caution, <laughs> um, but but not censorship. And, so, and I so think I was no, just going to ask. Um, so has Instagram um, censored any of the paintings? Because I know that's no. been an issue for a lot of artists who paint no. the nude. No. Not enough people. Not enough people follow me for, <laughs> for it to be a problem. You know, and I, I'm just I'm not a digital person either. You know, I mean, you know that I it's giving me pain looking at these images on the screen right now. Um, I hate Sorry. social media. I hate the internet. Um, I hate virtual artist talks. I hate virtual <laughs> exhibitions. Um, so that's just not really a world I live in too much. Um, that said, I do. <laughs> Thank you for watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, anyway, was there another question? I <laughs> Well, actually, we, we will um, we'll move to a next question. So what are, you know, some of the major influences on your work? I mean, I know you mentioned your your study at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts working from the model. Um, but what, what other influences either earlier on or or now, you know, they could be negative or, or you know, positive? Sure. Uh, you know, well, well, as an artist, I've had a lot of positive uh, influences. You know, I mean, there are artists that I look at that that kind of feed what I do um, in terms of either my attitude toward it, the subject matter, how I kind of deal with it. You know, I mean, um, there was a great uh, Philadelphia painter, Ben Kamahira, uh, who taught at Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. I never knew him, but his work, uh, you know, specifically with this this work in the gallery now, this kind of dreamlike nude, um, you know, that kind of exists in between, uh, you know, sort of worlds. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a big influence on me, that kind of dreamlike uh, way of treating imagery. And, and alongside that, you know, too, uh, Edwin Dickinson, again, a big, a big one among us representational painters. Um, somebody like David Lynch also, you know, this idea of, um, not necessarily being one thing or another, you know, it's, it's sort of existing between dreaming and waking between physical and, and, uh, spiritual between in this case, you know, the erotic or the sensual being, you know, sort of counteracted by something unsettling, um, something even maybe a little bit off putting, mm -hmm. you know, so slamming those things together and trying to get a work that, that operates in between one or the other. You know, I think somebody would have a very hard time saying these works are erotic because there are elements that are anti-erotic, you know, but at the same time, they are sensual, nude, female figures. So there is that element also, you know, but during the work, it's always about 
not letting it be too much, too identifiable, you know, so the experience can't be necessarily nailed right down. And, you know, from those painters I just mentioned, Kamahira, David Lynch, uh, uh, Edwin Dickinson, you know, that's, you know, in all three of them, you would never confuse their work with mm -hmm. each other. And then their work doesn't look anything like mine, but they are, you know, some pretty uh, significant um, conceptual uh, uh, influences for me. You know, in terms of just using paint and being an artist, I, I was hugely and continue to be hugely influenced by the Bay Area figurative painters of the 50s and 60s, you know, people like Deben Korn, David Park, uh, Manuel Neri, the, uh, the sculptor, mm -hmm. you know, and these were people who were reacting against um, abstraction, you know, so in, in New York at the time, it was all Deben Korn and Pollock and or not Deben Korn, but uh, de Kooning and, and Pollock and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Greenberg people with all the, the um, you know, purity of painting and purity of, of surface and, and all of that. And then over on the West Coast, these guys were like, ah, I think we could do, I think we could do something else. Um, I like that, you know, but they were, they were great painters. They were working with the, the picture plane and breaking it up and thinking abstractly and thinking about, you know, that whole push pull thing, but they were using it with the figure and it, it was so exciting. And, you know, it's 70 years old now, but it's still uh, really exciting for me to look at that, you know, and, and today, you know, I frequently see myself as reacting constantly to a lot of the work that's going on around me, you know, things that, and I, I call it clever art, um, you know, but it's, it's really heady text-based, you know, there's, there's, you know, some serious research and statements that go behind it and, mm -hmm. and all that. And that's not, I'm not saying that's a negative thing, you know, and, and I, I, I like to call it clever art rather than conceptual art because it's, it's smart stuff, you know, and it has a real kind of point to what it's doing. But at the same time, it's not always a real visual experience, you know, so when I look at that kind of work, I say, well, when I work, I want it, I want it to be not that, you know, a very conscious choice not to put elements in the paintings that you have to research to understand. You know, there's there's stuff in the paintings. You know, I refer to Surratt, I refer to Walter Sickert and, and all these other painters specifically in my work. Um, you know, so there is this this thing where if you if you know art history and you kind of understand how painting has evolved and, and all of that, you will get a lot of this intellectual content that I put in there, um, you know, through the act of painting and things like that. But you don't need it. You know, you don't need to know who, who Walter Sickert is in order to understand some of the references, especially in sort of the, the closer, smaller, more intimate kind of paintings. Um, you don't need it, but it's there. Uh, you know, so that's kind of, in a certain way, an anti-influence for me. You know, a lot of the contemporary work that's really, really heady and really, really conceptual, um, you know, but it does require homework. You know, there's there's a lot of work out there. You cannot walk in cold and know what the hell's going on. Mm -hmm. And then you can go over on the wall and read the the thing, which also is fine. It's a different kind of experience, but it's you know the opposite of what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, there's what um, as you call it, a clever art and even art activism being really big right now, mm -hmm. um, where you have to really know, either be up on your current events or read the, mm -hmm. the walls didactic um, sure. to, to um, really engage with it. So yeah. it's, it's nice to be able to just visually um, experience something. <laughs> well, when I was a student um, at the Pennsylvania Academy, I was, uh, it, it was right around the time the Iraq war started. You know, so I was, you know, I was young and, ah, um, you know, war is, is awful and all, all this stuff is, is horseshit and I'm an artist and I'm going to deal with that, you know, so I was working with figure and trying to make, you know, a really political work that's going to, you know, affect people and uh, a wonderful, wonderful painter, uh, Irving Petlin uh, mm -hmm. at the time, you know, who, who was an activist in, in, in life uh, and, and was a, a really, really just very sharp, uh, smart uh, painter, artist. 
And, uh, you know, he was involved in all these anti-war causes and, and activism and all of this stuff. And his work definitely dealt with that. You know, I, of course, you know, with the disappearances and, and, and all of that that his work kind of dealt with, but you could read his work in a, in a totally visual way. You know, he created these, these gorgeous, haunting uh, landscapes, and, and you could sense this idea of, of people and, and spirit being removed and, and things like that. I mean, they're gorgeous. Um, but he told me, um, you know, put, art's not going to change anything. He said, you know, uh, you know, in Vietnam and things like that, all of us were making art that was that was going to stop the war. And he said that that doesn't happen. You know, art activism, um, it's fine to do, but it, it's not going to, you know, I mean, you, you put a five thousand dollar price tag on it and hang it in a gallery. You're you're not changing the world, um, you know, so that's. In, in terms of activism and in terms of wanting my work to kind of affect the world in, in that kind of way, no, you know, I just don't respond to work like that. Um, unless it's done like, like Irving did, you know, where it was a visual experience that had this other content to it, if you wanted it, needed it. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't know about the disappearances and didn't understand the political situation that he was kind of talking about, you could still have an experience with that work that could be transcendent, that could send your mind off in different places and help you kind of uh, think about things in different ways. You know, mm -hmm. and I, and you mentioned earlier, you know, somebody might come in and say, well, is this pornography? Is this, you know, it's, it's painted, but is it, is it pornography? And, you know, of course, by an artist's definition of pornography, it, it most certainly is not. You know, you can paint pornographic pictures. That's not a problem. Just because it's paint doesn't mean it's it's not pornographic. Uh, you know, but the definition of art in my mind is that you've made an image that can send people off into a different place. You know, it, it triggers other thoughts. Pornography, on the other hand, does not. Pornography says, here is what this is for, mm -hmm. and you are designed to react to it in this way. You know, pornography is not going to make you you think about other stuff. I mean, that's the antithesis of pornography. Um, right. You know, yeah, it has a you're goal. Supposed to think about one thing. Uh, and and I hope that my my work has at least two thoughts involved. <laughs> so anyway. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I had a, a slide prepared um, because we, we were interesting talking about this one painting. Um, and but it actually it it was painted to go with one of Buckham's artist collaborators shows in 2020, A Climate of Change. Mm -hmm. Right. So let yeah. me bring that up real quick. There we go. Oh, yeah. So yeah. here we have. <laughs> So 2020, our Nine Prong Dong, which is part of a climate of change exhibition. Mm -hmm. And then in the gallery today, we also have New Dude. Um, and I was really surprised, like, um, thank you, Katie, for digging up the image so that we were able to have this um, for today. But <laughs> so you don't just um, use one um, drawing or painting that'll maybe work compositionally for another one. Sometimes you rework your canvases, right? Sure, sure, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, and and anything in this exhibition that's that's not sold uh, when it heads back to my studio next week, it's fair game. <laughs> oh no. Um, you know, so if anybody <laughs> wants to save anything, now's your chance. Um, oh, call Donovan. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, no, with, with the, uh, I was working on this painting on, on the left um, when that show was coming up and it was a themed show. Um, and I was kind of working with that pose, you know, again, I had kind of had this idea of dividing the canvas in a certain way. And I liked, um, you know, the idea of this leg heading off in the other direction and then, you know, bringing this kind of table form up front, you know, so that was, mm -hmm. You know, just the kind of formal problems I was working with. And I also kind of was interested in the idea of that, 
that the the top of the man um the the figure the the model um sort of disappearing you know where the the, the physical chair cuts it off what does that mean you know it doesn't mean specifically anything it's a it's a, a visual experience so what kind of a, what's happening you know and that was that was interesting to me I kind of like that just in a in an abstract way and we were working uh you know the 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 theme of the exhibition with the climate of change I was kind of thinking about pollution and mutation and and all of that kind of stuff and and so uh he multiplied um which I thought was funny you know it's it was it was humorous to me and I think humor belongs in art uh frequently not of course not always but you know why not and and I think art has to you know we we kind of have this idea that art has to be uh uh you know really serious and and you know take this seriously well I can I can spend three how 300 hours on a painting and put a joke in it it's you know that's fine um so well, it's, it's kind of amusing do. yeah yeah you've had paintings before with six fingers I mean yeah. uh, arms and legs that don't necessarily attach to to the figure um, well that's the beautiful thing about fine. painting yeah. yeah you know and I tell my students if, if you're going to use paint you're choosing to use paint why you know, if you're just trying to represent an object, go take a photograph of it. You're using paint because you can, you know, do anything with it. You can take that image and rearrange it and recreate reality. And now, of course, you can do that with, with photography, too. But, you know, with paint, paint does certain things. And it can be really, really fun to play with, you know. And, and maybe it's adding uh, a few extra penises or maybe it's moving an arm around where it shouldn't be or just playing with space you know there's a there's a piece in the exhibition i was at the uh, the art walk a, a couple of weeks ago and somebody came up and said who does that leg belong to oh i think is i that, have that slide is that the male whose leg is that <laughs> um you know of course it doesn't matter it's it's an abstract work in mm -hmm. essence um that said of course too uh, that painting, of course, nobody bought it. Why would they? Um, mm -hmm. There's no no reason to hang that over the mantelpiece. There. Uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> well, the nine pronged dong one was the one I was nobody. Oh, 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 sorry. Um, which is okay. Um, so it went back into the studio. about it. <laughs> yeah, it went back into the studio, and um, as I was working with this show, it it had a certain kinship, particularly with with this image on the left here. Um, in terms of tone and color and the way the paint was being used. And I felt like it belonged, um, but the nine prongs didn't, uh, you know, it just wasn't part of it. So I went back in and reworked it, you know, changed some colors, kind of brought the, the head and shoulders forward. So that was a little less about that dis disappearing, um, you know, so it was just kind of bringing it in line with its, its brethren here. Um, and that's that. Yeah. <laughs> that's how it <laughs> but that happens a lot. I re I rework paintings all the time, or I paint over them. You know, mm -hmm. if if I've shown them and sh maybe shown them a couple of times, and you know, why why store them? Mm -hmm. So let's do something else. Well, you mentioned the paint, the material, the paint, and the choice of that. I want to bring up the magician um, here. So so this painting is definitely. Um, figure beside is it's about the material. I mean, mm -hmm. here you have this like chunky um, application of paint and then the combination with the more highly rendered and turning of the form and just really uh, would love to hear you talk a little bit about it instead of me, you know, who does it. <laughs> well, again, that's that's why I love painting. Um, you know, that's that's what attracts me to it. That's what's kept me interested in it for 30 some years. Um, you know, paint just can do so many things and it can have so many effects. And, you know, I can I can use that oil paint to really kind of uh, uh, make make skin kind of look like skin and to to make form kind of have the illusion of, of, of existing in space. You know, and, and paint, you know, I mean, for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, artists have been using oil paint to do that. And at the same time, it's this substance, you know, it's colored mud and you can treat it as such, you know. So even within one painting, being able to go from rendering a form and, and sort of, you know, bringing a, a, a 
an image to some semblance of life, you know, giving it that convincibility, um, convince, convincingness, not convincibility. You don't want to convince the, the image itself, but um, mm -hmm. it's convincing, you know, you can, you can make this, this object that's illusionistic and, and, and looks like something, but then slap paint on there and it gives it this other kind of jerk. You know, and, and that happens in music all the time. You know, I was listening to uh, the soundtrack for The Exorcist. Um, and if you if you all are familiar with that, you know, it's it's orchestral. And, and there are these moments in it, you're listening to it and it's, you know, sort of atmospheric and the violins are sort of setting this, uh, this, this uh, tone, you know, it's, it's, um, it's calm and, and you feel, you know, sort of in a space. And then the violins shriek and it's cutting and harsh, you know? So in music, that same thing can happen where you're setting a mood, you're setting a scene, and then you can, you know, really all of a sudden puncture that and make something else happen. And paint is, is so good at that, can set the space, set the image, draw people in, it's flesh it's a body there's and then slam you're you're kind of faced with the pile of mud that paint is uh you know in, in the same way that those violins suddenly shrieked in that soundtrack and it it you know you suddenly were aware of the tool uh that it was being made yeah. with and uh you know paint paint is fun that way and, and and i do that you know this one is an extreme example but that exists in in most of my work you know i'm interested in that idea of form and and rendering an object uh rendering the appearance or the illusion of an object and then flattening things out or letting that paint sort of be itself and it just you know a, a little while back i was talking about existing in between two states you know, between maybe the physical and the spiritual, you know, in part of the narrative in the way the painting is made, that kind of technical narrative um, that emerges from all the parts of the painting working together uh, starts to kind of do that too. You know, if it were perfectly rendered and, and convincing space and everything, I wouldn't have that opportunity to, to, to separate those two and not let you rest on one or the other. You know, so again, using paint, uh, that's a, as, as itself, you know, is a, is a great tool, but it also is part of the content and the meaning of a work. Yeah. And uh, one of the, the greatest things about <laughs> oil paint, um, we had someone in the gallery this morning and they're like, wow, I can still smell the oil paint. Like how, how are these? I'm like, well, they're all within the last six months and we have that other <laughs> I mean once once they you know decades down the road you, you get that a lot less but <laughs> right now it's, it's <laughs> that's that sensual smell <laughs> yeah no I would uh you know if you on some of those if you pressed your thumb into a thick a thick part <laughs> uh you would be marked um there is still wet paint in there but that can last I mean for hundreds of years you know that I mean, yeah. they've, they've discovered, um, you know, Rembrandt paintings with with paint that's still wet, you know, deep in those layers. Uh, but again, that's oil paint, and it's it's what makes it so fun. Acrylic, uh, you know, and I worked in acrylic for years. It, it, you know, you, you don't quite have that that sense of danger, but also that sense of I can work on this painting for a really, really long time. You know, it's still going to be alive. These paintings, you know, the ones that haven't sold will come back into my studio. They're still alive, you know, mm -hmm. and I can open them back up and and find new things in them. Um, and that's that's why, you know, being an artist is a is a wonderful thing and being able to do that and, and live that way. Um, it's just marvelous. OK, so I know I already had this slide up, but mm -hmm. I was just thinking. Um, so in this show, and um, we have encaustic paintings by yeah. you, um, and th this is fairly new. Yeah. Um, from what I understand, when did you start using encaustic? May. <laughs> <laughs> and this it started in May. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so oil paint. I've been doing oil paint. I've been working with charcoal 
um, for 30 plus years. And, and uh, you know, I feel like I know it pretty well and I don't have to think about technique. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm, when I'm making a painting, I don't really have to really think about how I'm going to make the thing look the way I want it to look. It's just, you know, I, I, I've just been doing it for so, so long. I know what paint's going to do. And, and I know it intuitively, oil paint uh, and charcoal. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, I, I just understand it very, very well. And I had an opportunity in May uh, to just play a little bit and, and kind of mess around um, and not, not really have to worry about producing for a few weeks. And I had always been interested in, in caustic paint. Um, I, I think it's beautiful. I think the whole idea uh, of it is, is amazing, but I had never really uh, taken the time to, to learn it. Mm -hmm. And I did have some, uh, and I had some of the equipment necessary to do it, but I had never really taken the time to do it. I had the opportunity and it was so refreshing and so exciting because I had no idea how to make it work. <laughs> Unlike yeah. oil paint, you know, uh, the, the material all of a sudden became a real uh, part of, of the thinking process mm -hmm. of, of the painting. Whereas with the oil paintings, it's not part of the thinking process. You know, it's, it's me and the paint doing our thing. You know, like like people who have known each other a really long time. You know, you just you know which restaurant to go to. You know, <laughs> um, but with the encaustic, it was very very different. So it it really kind of um, opened up some new inventiveness in terms of color. It made the just the working process totally different, and in doing so, it it made me think a little bit differently. So so forms and color and space all of a sudden became much different uh, than they are in the oil paintings. And for me, that was really pretty exciting. Um, now I worked at it uh, for a few weeks and did a bunch of them. And I started to, uh, you know, kind of figure out how it was gonna work and what it was gonna do. And they started to get a little bit more slick and a little more predictable. So, you know, looking at that wall, um, you'll kind of see the roughest ones. You know, and those were the earliest ones where I was struggling with the material. And then they slowly kind of get to where they're kind of in the same realm as the oil paintings. The color is very different because of the material and, and the way I was thinking about color, but the handling of the forms and everything started to be a little bit more predictable. You know, so that, um, you know, just the progress of kind of working through a material um, you know, but I, I work with paint and I, I work with images, you know, so it didn't take long for me to get a facility with it. And Okay, so this is how it's going to work. Okay, we can. Yeah. And I love your, your, the evidence of going, you know, additive and subtractive and going in and you have, your, you can see the, the incised line from the pencil mm -hmm. being drawn through, um, which I, I, I love. And I, I love the intimate scale of the small mm -hmm. ones, you know, that you maybe <laughs> don't do as much with the oil paint. No. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of little oil paintings too, but yeah, the encaustic yeah. is, um, and particularly, you know, because I, I hadn't been doing encaustic for long, you know, I had a, a tiny little setup and not a lot of paint, mm -hmm. you know, so it was great to just have these tiny little paintings and I could kind of learn the material and, um, uh, yeah, it was really fun. I, I think I would like to try and do some larger ones, which mm -hmm. I think would um, bring back that that challenge of the earliest earliest moments of trying to learn the material, mm -hmm. you know, scaling up a little bit, you know, I'll, I'll kind of find some of that awkwardness again, um, mm -hmm. which is really artistically useful, you know, when you can find something that just uh, isn't isn't natural to you, you know, it just inspires invention and doing new things. And that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, like deciding to draw with your left hand instead of your, or your non-dominant 
right. hand, hand or foot. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a good thing to, to do. To have a little loose nose, yeah. And, um, and it, it's obvious that you do have uh, the, the skills from your drawings and, and paintings when approaching the encaustic because you, know, you are painting with, with the wax, whereas a lot of um, went out, you know, visiting different galleries and things, you see encaustics where it seems to be just sort of wax poured over a digital image or, or something, photograph or something that then worked in. So I, I just love the evidence of, of hand um, in your work um, and, and, and that, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a common way encaustic is taught, you know, and it's, mm. uh, um, it can be a very, uh, uh, challenging material, you know, so a lot of times if you want to take an encaustic workshop and they want to teach you how the paint works, how the material works, you know, it's, it's used a lot in a collage kind of a way, mm -hmm. you know, so you'll use these kind of images and things and collage them using the wax. Uh, and that's, you know, it's a teaching tool, definitely. And then, you know, artists will, will do other stuff with it. Me as a painter, you know, and and I really am not a a skilled collage artist. You know, it's it, that's never been a, a part of what I do. Um, you know, so when I approached encaustic, it was about dabs of color kind of coming together to make a form. So, you know, I learned I learned encaustic the way most people don't. <laughs> you know, I just kind of tried to make it look like like my work. Um, you know, and so I, that's not a helpful thing to say. It doesn't matter. <laughs> well that and you didn't go to a workshop you, you just had the materials and, oh. and, and played with it which is really the great thing about you know creating art I mean is, is the playfulness mm -hmm. and that's still evident you know the enjoyment in it um, this exhibition has actually seen um, near record sales we're a nonprofit arts organization we are not a commercial gallery that has to sell half of our shows to to survive that we frequently bring work here for the in return of our community sort of educational and and for that exposure um but of course sales are fun sure. everyone loves it artists love to sell the work so i thought i would bring this up um I noticed that your the pricing of your work seems to be very intentional and in keeping it sort of on the moderate low side and has therefore benefited from this. And I was just wondering if you could share a little bit about your philosophy on pricing work. Sure. Well, you know, I, I mean, a, a work of art is only as has as much uh, monetary value as somebody is willing to pay for it, right? You know, so there are artists that price their work very, very high and they never sell anything mm -hmm. because nobody's willing to pay that much money for that work, you know, but in their minds, they think, well, I spent, you know, hundreds of hours on it and all these materials and, and everything. So, that, you know, it has to be $10,000. I spent half a year on it, mm -hmm. which is logical. Of course, but if nobody's going to pay ten thousand dollars for it, you've got all that work into it, and you have the painting, and th and that's it. You know, you for for me, you know, I don't need to be surrounded by my own work. I make hundreds of paintings a year. I they've got to go. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to repaint them. <laughs> I don't need to 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 look at my work. Now, am I going to make a, a lot of money doing that? No, of course not. But at the same time, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a teacher. I work uh, at the Flint Institute of Arts. You know, I I have income um, from from my work, my my jobs. Um, but I don't I don't have to make money from the art. Uh, but you know, if I can bring in a little bit of income and help pay for the 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 materials and and the frames and things like that, that's that's great. Um, that's not really my philosophy. That's just practical stuff, right? You know, if I can get a uh, hundred dollars for a painting, but I can't get two hundred dollars for it, I'm gonna sell the damn thing for a hundred dollars. Take it, right? I'm gonna make more. It's not. It's fine. 
yeah, I, that makes my hourly wage, you know, 25 cents an hour on that painting, but that's okay. You know, that that's not what it's about for me. Um, philosophically, I feel strongly that people should live with art. Mm -hmm. I think that is an essential human thing. You have got to have art in your life and not stuff that you buy from a department store. You know, I mean, have something that somebody made that doesn't exist anywhere else. Enrich your life. You know, that's that's really, really important. I think just in, in being human. Um, so I want to make sure that my work is as accessible as possible. You know, if somebody wants a piece of my work, uh, I want it to be to be possible. You know, if, if somebody has a couple hundred dollars to spend, um, my work is available, you know, and, and that's that's really important to me. I really, really want to participate in helping people live with art, to become collectors, to become involved with art uh, a little bit more intimately, you know, and not just kind of maybe pop into a show, but to really get involved and maybe want to live with a piece that that inspires them or um, makes them happy or, or you know, keeps their mind moving in different ways. Uh, that's, that's really, really important to me. Um, you know, and it, it would have been uh, fine if I didn't sell anything at the show. Honestly, I didn't expect to. Um, this type of work doesn't necessarily always sell really well, um, especially in traditional venues. Um, but it did, and and I couldn't be happier. I'm I'm so proud and and flattered that people wanted to live with my work, and I'm happy that it was priced in such a way that that it was possible for them to do that. So that's yeah, my blog. Yeah. <laughs> And I love that. And having having real art in your your home and your surroundings is so important because you you see new things, you know, your own personal experiences change. So each time you come up to something, you can have a new experience. And in many ways, it's like rereading um, your a favorite book multiple times over your life. Each time you read it, you, you come to it as maybe not a totally different person, but, but it has a different influences, you know, and, sure. and have a different reading of it. And I feel that, um, you know, art, visual art is, is that also, um, to look at things again. Um, hopefully Absolutely. the most successful works of the visual art are things that you can look at <laughs> in one, in your home for, uh, again and again, mm -hmm. <laughs> not, not just to match the couch. <laughs> But if you're buying original work to match the couch, that's fine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that green painting over your shoulder there, I think would go marvelous in some kind of mid-century, you know, kind of furnishings. Um, you know, so that, that that's okay. Yeah. This coffee table right in front of that would be great. You know, so I am open I think, for that kind of thing. Yes, yes, of course. Yes, it's okay. To... Right. Well, um, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure um, to chat with you, Jonathan, today. Um, I, you know, thank you, as always, for sharing your work and your time with Boston Gallery, our Flint audience, and our virtual audience, because uh, we appreciate everyone. Um, and, and yeah, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's It's been a lot of fun. I've been so proud of the show and, and Buckham, you know, is, is just so top notch the way everything is handled and the way you and Katie and everybody does everything. It's just marvelous. And thank you for that. Oh, wow. Thank you so much to Donovan for talking with me today. It was really a pleasure. I always enjoy um, chatting with with all of our artists and, and today was no exception. So I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did and learned a few things on the way. So thank you so much um, for, for watching. We appreciate you, bye.